Hi folks, welcome to the Weekend Podcast. I'm joined by Josh and we're going to be talking about this wonderful article on Pink News. A Christian mum who said she lost her kids to the trans cult spectacularly called out by her own children. Josh, you're, you're a psychologist. Yep. Is this psychologically healthy? I would imagine not. Like disavowing your own parents, generally speaking, <laughs> For is internet crap. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you need to be a psychologist to know that that's a bad thing. <laughs> right. So it's it's not what you would advise in a professional capacity in any way. No, and and in a personal one as well. <laughs> generally speaking. <laughs> right. So uh, I've I've done a fair amount of reading about cults, and you being a psychologist, you obviously know something about like you know what's not good. Um, so Arthur, Arthur Diekman was a Californian psychologist who in the 60s, 70s and 80s was himself a part of loads of different cults. And I read his book, The Wrong Way Home, where he documents uh, how these cults operate, how he became involved with them, how he got out of them, what he found in them. And he found that cults seem to form around four different uh, principles. So the first one is compliance with a group. The second one is dependence on a leader. The third one is devaluing the outsider. And the fourth one is avoiding dissent. And so any one of these things doesn't make a cult, in his view. Uh, it was the combination of all of these things. So, it, And the, the more of these principles that you are, you are adhering to, the closer you are to being a cult, in his opinion. Is there anything there you would take objection to? No, I don't think so. And in, intuitively, if I were to break it down, those would probably be the four factors I would go to, actually. Just yeah. And it's the sort of thing when you when you look at like you know the Simpsons parodies of cults. That's the kind of thing that they're being parodied. And yeah, so, absolutely. You know, I I would you know I think that's a fair assessment. Um, and so I, I find this really interesting because I I don't uh, I don't think this hits them all, but it's pretty close. And the only one that I see that's outstanding is dependence on a leader. Uh, but even then, that might be me being optimistic. But anyway, so we'll, we'll just go through what this uh, what this wonderful article says and have a look. So, Christian mum who said she lost her trans kids to the cult was called out. A Christian woman who testified in favour of South Dakota's anti-trans bill has been spectacularly called out by her own children after she gave an interview saying that she lost them to the trans cult. Uh, this is not new, is it? This is not like a rare thing. I mean, this is, this is something that I think a lot of parents are probably experiencing themselves because of online twitter leftism yeah well you had the uh, the people calling out their parents for being at the trump rally yeah. and I, c I can think of examples in history where there have been kind of similar ideological uh movements yeah exactly yeah. like uh, a good one i think is is it pavlik morisov or something along those lines he was essentially a 13 year old boy in soviet russia mm -hmm. who said that his dad was against the government because he'd overheard him talking about um, anti-communist stuff, essentially. Yeah. And so um, upon informing the authorities, um, I think his father was imprisoned and then his family killed him, his, as in the 13-year-old boy, for betraying his family. And then the Soviets erected a statue of him to show that he is like their prime example of dedicating himself to the state over the family. Oh my God, that is terrifying. And, and that... <laughs> on, but the, this is the sort of thing that we're seeing here, though, isn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, like, yeah. I, I just find it incredible. It's like my, you know, my mum was at the the Capitol protest. Like, okay, so what then? Well, like, that means I dob them into the FBI. It's like, why? You know? Surely your your loyalty to your your family should outweigh the loyalty to the state. Like that's that should be a given for ninety nine percent of people. And that, that and that that's the terrifying thing about this because, like the the distinction between society and the state is essentially the distinction between a lone individual being dependent on the government and a person being a member of a family or a, a sort of familial group and so yeah when you when you see this kind of bond being broken in favor of the state i mean that frankly makes me think totalitarianism is coming yeah it's, it's definitely a red flag yeah exactly red flag is is the best way to describe it i think um but anyway lynn mager who has two trans kids was interviewed for a piece in the Christian Post titled I've Lost Two Kids to the Trans Cult, I Want Them Back. An anguished mum shares her journey. Uh, like I said, I think this is reflective of many, uh, the concerns of many parents, especially as, I mean, this is, if it was like, you know, Backstreet Boys fan club or something, or whatever <laughs> modern version of that is, you know, I can't think of any 
boy bands that are, but anyway you know that sort of thing right that I, it strikes me as that's a normal thing that people go through it's there's a trend there's a fad they get into it that's fine because normally like there aren't many life-changing consequences of having been a die-hard fan of the backstreet boys or something right but there are major impacts on your life from becoming transgender Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the changes, if you actually go through the medical procedures, are yeah. irreversible. Yes. So and that's... Leaves you sterile. Yeah. So yes. it's it's pretty extreme as far yeah. as cults go. Yeah. I mean, it's like... the. the I mean, it, it goes down to everything, though, doesn't it? Like, the, the, the hormone treatments are not well understood and so we don't know about if it's if it's done with particularly young people then we don't know about like the effects on bone density as they grow up but we do know that it actually does have a negative impact on that so that's bad and you've got all sorts of other sort of you know osteoporosis and things like this I, like I, I have no idea i'm not an expert i think that's that's more for kind of your okay. your doctors and your physical health yeah. because I, I don't really know about yeah no that i, so I don't know otherwise but I, i've read articles where you know it has been you know medical experts it, it really like, doesn't surprise me because your your hormones while yeah. you're developing play an instrumental role in all of your physical development and if you impede that you're going to yes. have horrendous side effects exactly and then you know like lack of bone density increased rates of cancer um sterility all all of these really impactful things and then you get and that's not even talking about when with having surgery either you know then you could be you know having parts of your body sliced off which again is all experimental and like what was they called neo vaginas the the of what ne- neo vaginas <laughs> I've never heard of I, that I've, term I've done before. a fair amount of reading about this trans stuff. Um, <laughs> the, there are there are websites about people who have ha- regretted having the surgery because it turns out that uh, even even the uh, the surgery about um, inverting the penis and turning it into a vagina is experimental surgery. It's not well. Um, there's there's a case study that they they teach early on. I, I was taught it mm-hmm. when I was studying A level psychology. Yeah. So while I was still in school, and essentially the, the case study for um, the, the gender topic that yeah. is covered, there's essentially a, a boy whose circumcision went wrong, and they decided, you know what, we're going to raise him as a girl, and I've then this. Um, he he grew up as a girl, but then eventually kind of disavowed his upbringing. And said, "Listen, I'm a man," and tried to live as a man, but then eventually didn't he commit suicide? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of this one. Yeah, and that's like a, a go-to oh, case study. It's a, you know, a tragic, tragic thing. Yeah, it's so, awful. Just, just to be clear, jo- Josh's experience in psychology didn't end at A levels either. He's got no. a master's degree, but just, just so, just in case people were wondering. Um, but yeah, so, um, so yeah, I, I, I genuinely, I mean, I am a parent, right? I've, I've got three kids, eleven, five, and like two months, two months. And uh, my my daughter has already started. She she's a bit of a tomboy anyway, and I'm genuinely concerned that she's going to end up going down this road because I think that the environment in her school and the way that society is currently going now is is very not not just permissive but almost encouraging of these sort of things. And I'm like, you know, she's she's obviously a girl. There's nothing, you know, there. But it's like could she be groomed into it herself? And I'm genuinely worried. You know, it's, it's... I think um, parental influence is a big part of it, though. Like, oh, yeah. if having someone who's at least passively accepting mm. of it or open to the idea is going to help it along a lot more than someone who kind of nips it in the bud oh, early Don't worry, on. I've been the complete opposite. <laughs> I've, I've, look, the patriarchy is good, and this is what you're going to get from it. <laughs> I've already explained to her, look, you need to plan out how many kids you're going to have. <laughs> Her, her answer at the moment is zero, but she's only 11. She'll get you. Um, anyway, <laughs> but I'm genuinely worried about it. We're laughing, but it is, it's, I, I think it is a genuine concern. It, it is certainly a cause for concern, especially yeah. considering that the, the way these sorts of things are taught in schools now is all about acceptance and understanding differences and almost Equal even... Equal valuation is what I think I would describe it as. So... Um, you know, I, I don't want anyone to be persecuted or stigmatized or anything like that, but there are significant downsides to being transgender. Absolutely. And yeah. I don't think that we should uh, uh, approach the subject and pretend that being transgender is as physically and mentally healthy as not being transgender. And that's not me trying to, you know, pour scorn or anything like that. It's just there are these real downsides. I mean, it's an objective fact. There's so much scientific data to suggest that it's 
more harmful than not yeah. being transgender that it's it's pretty conclusive like the, the suicide rate alone is enough yeah. to suggest that it's a really severe condition that you don't necessarily want to get yeah or that is uh, gender dysphoria i should say with yeah. transgenderism isn't recognized as its own kind of psychological condition right but gender dysphoria is a yeah. psychological disorder as i understand it yeah although um there's there's been a lot of debate about whether it is or it isn't it it was definitely kind of decided upon and then it's been kind of revised here and there. Do you think but that's because of political activism? Absolutely. Right. W okay. Without a doubt. Okay, that's, that's <laughs> clear. Right, gotcha. Um, anyway, right. So in the interview, uh, Mega speaks at length about her refusal to accept her trans children, which she blames them for, and her, and her hurt at the fact that they disagree with her transphobic views on gender identity. I wish I'd got the uh, original article up, actually. It would probably be entirely reasonable. But, uh, and I, I say that because I think this is an entirely unreasonable framing of uh, the thing. I mean, to, to label her concerns inherently as transphobic, I mean, I guess from the position of the radical left, that's probably true. But they've failed to address anything the, in the root of the disagreement. So, like, I would imagine if she's... What, a, a Christian mum? Yeah. She's probably saying there are two genders. Yes. You can't move between them. Yes. It's a very, you know... Doubtless, the, very biblical. The, the normal view. <laughs> but, um, I mean, the response to this was amazing, right? <laughs> because it's, it's like a caricature. It's like genuine parody. The response to this was, she didn't lose me to a cult, uh, said her eldest daughter, clarifying that she is estranged because her mum is racist, abusive, transphobic, greedy, cruel, and religiously intolerant, which is exactly what <laughs> I'd expect someone who was lost in a cult to say. But, yeah, that's that's ticking all the boxes for me, to be honest. <laughs> just buzzwords. Just, just here's a bunch of buzzwords. My mother is all of these things, and therefore I disavow my mother. Like, and I, I, I go to my Twitter friends and, and they reinforce yeah, everything it's, I've it's said. Like, and then Pink News reinforce everything I said. <laughs> like, like morally condemning your own parents and kind of trying to other them in favour of a group of people that are supposedly have no ties to you just seems like one of the, the quintessential um, traits of a cult. Yeah, and, and not not just that, the ties are very abstract. You know, the they're, they're ag agreements on opinion on some th aspect of, you know, a theory. And yeah. it's like, okay, that, I mean, really, you're going to disavow your parents for that. Yeah, I, I think your, your love for your parents should go beyond <laughs> agreeing with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> there'd be yeah. very few. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 but that's exactly right. And the thing is, if we go back to Diekman's, um four categories, four, pro four principles, so compliance with the group, devaluing the outsider and avoiding dissent, I would suggest are actually strongly on display here. Um, compliance with the group being like, you know, you can't be racist, transphobic, all of these things. Devaluing the outsider, the mother is evil, effectively, because she is these things. And avoiding dissent, well, we're not having a discussion about this. You know, this is categoric. She has been told, you are these things, and therefore you're bad. And so she says, she lost me because she's a piece of shit. It's true, I, we won't speak to her, though her turfness was only the tip of the iceberg. She was extremely emotionally and physically abusive growing up, which I guess we'll just have to take her word for. Um, it's terrible, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't know what to say to that. Like, yeah. what would drive someone to be so hostile to their parents, especially being publicly hostile yeah. i'm assuming this is this is in an interview as well oh absolutely yeah yeah, yeah so is, and, and obviously it's been all over twitter and stuff so it's like like it, it seems to me about like ingratiating herself within a group that yeah. devalues outsiders avoids dissent and adheres to this particular string of ideology um so it, it just this looks like cult behavior to me this just really strikes me as being like, well, this is what someone in a cult would say. It's not necessary to go to the, the national <laughs> yeah, yeah. press about yeah. something like this. International press. Like, fact. yeah, you, surely you would, if if it were like a valid grievance yeah. between a child and a parent, it would yeah. stay within the household and they'd probably talk it out. I suppose the counter argument would be, well, the mum did do an interview with Christian Press, the Christian Post. Sorry. Okay. So I, I suppose the counter argument there would be, well, her mum started it. And so, okay, well, maybe, you know, but uh, did they, were they on Twitter? Were they being public about all of this? The answer is obviously yes. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the children aren't even young. 
you know? That's the thing that's interesting about it. Uh, Mega, the real names of the children, uh, but uh, don't worry about that. The children are 36 and 24. Uh, so it's not like they're... Okay, when, when you're saying children, I was well, assuming how, like... That's how they've been framing it, right? <laughs> so it's like they are her children. But again, that doesn't mean they're not part of a cult. Uh, but the thing is, she also dead named and misgendered them throughout their piece. Do you know Wait. what those things are? Of course. Like dead. <laughs> so I, I'm assuming they've actually, actually become transgender themselves. I, I assume so. We, so uh, the, 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 the children, uh, as in both adults, obviously, are, um, are, are both transgender, yeah. I mean, just what are the statistical odds of that happening, like, organically? Pretty low, I would guess. Yeah, that's the fact that both of them... Are as well. Mm. That that seems to suggest some kind of either yeah. ridiculously strong genetic link, which you know we haven't found yet, yeah. or there's some degree of socialization going on. And I'm judging from the the kind of the whole thing surrounding it. They're they're trying to out their mother in particular for mm. brownie points with their kind of social circles. By the sounds of it, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean the 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 son, if we can say son. I mean. I don't know, uh, uh, called it hateful rhetoric coming from the mother. And I found that really interesting in the light of, you know, calling someone racist, abusive, transphobic, greedy, cruel, and religiously intolerant. I mean, that just seems like hateful rhetoric to me. But Yeah. I mean, like, like, surely, for surely fingers, as well, you know. um, they're trying to play the victim here, but yes. she's she's the one who's lamenting the loss of her children. Yes. And, and going to the, the lengths of contacting the international press probably yeah. bringing a lot of uh, and the children are on the attack that's the yeah. thing the mother's like well i'm sad that my my children won't talk to me because i think they've fallen into this transgender cult and the response is attack 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 devalue 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 uh, there's there's at no point does there seem to be any real engagement with what the mother is complaining about and trying to um, address the points that she's made it's just calling her a bad person. It's like, look, any any group of people that are trying to encourage you to denounce your own parents as bad people are people you should be highly suspect of, at the very minimum, you know, the very bare minimum. But um, apparently uh, she's accused of em inflicting emotional and religious abuse and physical violence on him and his siblings growing up. And I'm just thinking, right, okay. I mean, you could you could frame a smacked bottom as that, you know, you could you could frame being forced to go to church as that. Uh, neither of these things I would call abuse. You know, in the yeah. in the term that we're using it as, you know. And so, is it just the case of the children went towards the radical left because of whatever online bubble they happened to be it in? Definitely sounds like it. It yeah. really sounds like it, right? So, and I, of, of course, the the accusations they're making there are so prone to being subjectively interpreted that it could mean the the mildest of yeah offences yeah exactly um i mean don't get me wrong it could be that the mother was you know incredibly domineering and aggressive and abusive it, it, you know i'm not saying that that's not the case it is impossible know. to tell isn't it yeah. it is impossible to tell it's just given the context that which we're in and the kind of people we appear to be dealing with and the kind of outlet that's reporting it i'm not inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt uh they seem to uh, be fair in yeah. that as well it, they seem to have too much invested you know but um but uh, interestingly as well, then then come the smears, right? So again, we've we've gone with compliance with the group. So the mother doesn't comply with the group, the the, the kids do. Uh, they devalue the mother, obviously. And then avoiding dissent uh, is really something that I think we've also seen. Because, like, you... the, the Interestingly, the, the smears are now where it comes in. So the mother apparently has links to the neo-fascist group Proud Boys and uh, British anti-trans feminist Posey Parker. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know who that second person is but that was a very strong description of the proud boys if i ever heard it yeah i yeah i mean they're not fascist but like you know they're they're, they're they're not angels don't get me wrong um but i wouldn't call them fascists um and posey parker is a gender essentialist uh, do you know who posey parker is no i haven't heard of she's him. a british feminist who believes that uh, a woman is an adult human female so a turf, essentially. Yes. Okay. She's in fact she's like the alpha turf. In fact. <laughs> she's uh, she's quite outspoken on this. Is there such a thing as an alpha turf? There is. Posey's <laughs> one of them, I would say. But the thing is, like, 
the her radicalism stems from her dictionary definition of woman. That's what it is. Adult human female is a radical thing for this position to encounter. It's so radical that it describes what fifty percent of the population. But I mean, like most people probably subscribe to that definition of woman as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. like, <laughs> I mean, anyway, they say that, uh, the, and the thing is, that they they bring up Posey Parker's. Um, Posey Parker doesn't have like the world's largest internet presence, but it's the fact that she represents solidly a position that is uh, oppositional to the social justice position, which is why she enjoys outsized prominence in their minds. In the, honestly, in the same way that Tommy Robinson enjoys outsized prominence in the mind of someone like Sadiq Khan, right? Um, they 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 they're they're more symbolic. And so we, we get to hear about how Posey Parker is, uh, you know, she, she had an interview with a French Canadian white nationalist, uh, which was JF Garapé, who's a YouTuber who I guess, I mean, that's not an entirely una- inaccurate description of him, but the fact that now we're lumping in Posey Parker and who she's spoken to. And it's like, you know, the, the net of people who are bad and to be disavowed has begun to widen. Yeah. It's, it's also, Resorting to guilt by association rather than the actual crimes of the individual. Just simply by associating with someone is enough to supposedly (laughs) just do away with them entirely. Well, what's interesting is we got like one, uh, well, I'll say paragraph, one sentence really about like what the mother thinks about these things. And we've got, you know, four or five sentences about the bad people that the mother has spoken to or the people that the mother has spoken to has spoken to themselves. Because the next one is like, in October 2019, Posey Parker appeared in what Mums Net user. Oh no, that was the one. Sorry, uh, Megan Me- Mega met Parker along with another British anti-trans feminist called Venice Allen, who I've never heard of when they went to the US. And so it's like, okay, so we're expanding the web of like anti-trans guilt by association now. Uh, okay, I mean this. I mean, don't get me wrong. It sounds like the mother is herself an internet activist, right? It sounds like there's there's been this sort of schism in their family where the mother has fallen into the sort of Christian Twitter, we'll call it, and then the kids have fallen into progressive Twitter and become trans. And so I I don't know if they're reconcilable positions at this point, to be honest. I really doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I strongly doubt I mean, I love the way that Pinkney's described this. The three women were connected by the Hands Across the Aisle organization, which connects religious bigots with transphobic bigots. <laughs> Which sounds very tolerant and inclusive, really, if you put it that way. <laughs> it's, it's a network of bigots. Just... <laughs> okay, Wait, so... are, you, are you on about Pink News or the... Uh... Uh, the, 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 big, the bigot network that Pink News is complaining about. Oh, right. I but... mean, uh, people in glass houses. Oh, exactly, right? <laughs> uh, that's exactly it. People in glass houses. Like, it, bigotry is generally, uh, in, in common English, is just an intolerance of other people's ideas. Uh, and it's like, okay, well, you don't exactly show much tolerance of the mother's ideas or Posey Parker's ideas or anyone else's ideas. So it seems to be like a bigot fight at the moment. It's like, you're bigots. Yeah, well, you're bigots. It's like, well... It sounds like no one's going to win out of that yeah, exactly. exchange. Yeah, uh, obviously, we get to hear about how the Proud Boys are listed by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a white nationalist extremist hate group. Uh, yes, but loadseasers.com lists the Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate and misinformation group, so we don't have to listen to them. <laughs> I've just declared it. <laughs> and uh, But yeah, so basically, I, I really do think that Pink News and these sort of um, these online groups do form cults in some way. Like, like leaderless cults where the group itself replaces uh, becomes like the the leader and i think it i think it works in the kind of um in the in the kind of uh, way that enlightenment morality works where a- any rational actor can be a moral legislator and so anyone can from the principles that have been adopted by the group uh, extract from that and create a form of sort of moral legislation so you know um saying that trans people shouldn't be able to adopt children is transphobic because, and then they'll just refer to whatever the presupposed um, moral principles of the group are. And I I think that the internet has kind of created these things. Like these things, you know, cults existed before the internet, but the internet makes it really easy to get into these spaces where you don't ever hear the outside opinion. You don't hear any dissent. You don't do anything other than agree with the other people in the group. Well, the internet kind of has the perfect environment for it because they, they, 
the algorithms select kind of ideas and news stories and everything it, it caters to you and feeding back to your ideas and what you're already interested in exactly well, yeah. so you get more of the same so you never hear the outside perspective i think this is this is why um the, the 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 great problem of modern politics has come down to even agreeing on what the facts are now because you'll notice that each side has their own set of facts and it's not that they're wrong it's just that really they should be meshing these together so they all have the same facts and instead they've pulled this apart and so you've got one narrative of one thing and one narrative of another thing and neither of them can really be budged because technically they're both true well i think that they're coming at it from two different views mm. of truth aren't they there's one that's looking at kind of objective truth and then there's one with subjective truth and these two views are irreconcilable as far as i'm concerned yes and there's there's no way that you can look at kind of numerical objective evidence as someone who values subjectivity mm. and they'll say well that this dehumanizes my lived experience and oh. then I, you know, I think you can. What what you can do is essentially the interpretation of these things then becomes up for debate. Uh, so they'll say, oh, trans, you know, if if we, you know, you, you're the trans and I'm the anti-trans and I say, well, look, don't become trans because 40% of people who are trans attempt suicide. Uh, you'll say, OK, yeah, that, that might be true. Uh, and I'll say it's because there's something wrong with them because they have gender dysphoria. And you'll say, no, it's society that's wrong. And yeah. so it's it's not that we can't this is the thing is it's it's actually not that they don't agree that objective reality exists the problem is their view of objective reality they they think it's evil basically sure and uh, it needs to change and so this is like radical enlightenment politics where it's like right okay everything has to change because of this very very tiny constituency you know a very small number of people who they're concerned about it's uh, <laughs> it's well it is it's it's it's, it's such an absurd place to be now as, yeah. a, as a society where we're, we're essentially a significant number of the majority have to change to cater for a very tiny fraction of the minority yeah. which also are viewed by the kind of medical world as having a disorder yes. essentially yes and it, the, the the validation of disorders is a very interesting thing and worries it, me. it doesn't really happen in any other area like could you imagine go into a schizophrenic like yes those those voices you're hearing are really real and that, that, <laughs> well, that's <laughs> it, there'd be nothing doing, worse yeah <laughs> well that's the thing isn't it like like I, it just seems and again this total layman perspective but if it was someone i cared about i wouldn't do that to them that well yeah you would you would want to understand yeah their their motivation for kind of going along with this and surely you would be able to get to the bottom of why they would have such a, an unusual view mm. and the, there are incentives for people to to kind of follow these sorts of things um, oh, as, uh, huge incentives in modern civilization like in, in, in yeah. the, the current state of affairs you get all this kind of press attention mm -hmm. you, you'll get all sorts of um social brownie points you know the, the and this is why you have the phenomenon of trans trenders i imagine that the, the people calling out their mother are hoping that they're going to get some viral tweets yeah and maybe they can make a career out of being an activist or yeah. something along those lines so they're essentially throwing their own family under the bus for essentially Fame. yeah that's awful <laughs> that's absolutely awful um right was there any was there anything else you think uh, we could add to this or should we wrap it up there um no, I, I think we've covered it pretty conclusively. I, I mean, I think the the four factors that you listed were quite good mm. in capturing what I kind of conceive of mm. as a cult, and I think there's there's certainly some utility in applying that to. Yeah, yeah. One one of the things that um, Diekman uh, goes on at at length in the book, but didn't include in his four sort of principles, was the the concept of processing. Uh, these would be the sort of sort of struggle sessions. Uh, one of, one of the one of the things is, um, and you see this a lot in like left wing circles, where it's the sort of mechanism of keeping people within the group and uh, quashing dissent it is to essentially put them on the spot and have lots of people um, essentially attacking their personality and attacking their character for being wrong, and it's it's a way of like you know breaking down their emotional defenses until they become malleable and can be rebuilt in the sure, image of the cult. Because to, to most people, I imagine being attacked for who you are is probably one of the most stressful things you can go through in Absolutely. in modern life, where there's no 
you're not you're not out hunting and yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> in but, the environment of adaptation. But in any in any in any circumstance, if you have like if you and and this is the thing in in Diekmann's day, it was obviously done in real life with like a half a dozen people who'd be sat around telling them they're bad people, you know, questioning this, questioning that, see, making sure they had the orthodox responses where they were supposed to, and attacking them where they didn't, and that's. That's, I mean, the the description that he gave of this happening in these various cults sounded awful. You know, it, they called it processing, and uh, you know, it's very much sort of like you know, struggle sessions and things like that. Uh, but then you think, okay, this is what happens on a daily basis on Twitter. This is what calling out is. You know, when like tens of thousands of people on Twitter uh, go after J.K. Rowling for having an opinion on what gender is, what they're doing is very much mimicking Diekman's view of the processing that goes on, where it's like. You know, you you are meant to bend the knee to this group and admit that you're wrong and the group's right, and therefore you take on the attributes of the group, you take on the new, you know, worldview of the group, and this confirms your position in the cult. And so the fact that like someone like J.K. Rowling with millions and millions of people saying to her, "You're an evil bigot," uh, that must be insanely stressful, like insanely stressful. Yeah, no doubt, and especially as someone who is so revered up until she, yeah. Like she was kind of known as the the successful uh, female author for yeah. a long time, and she was kind of held up as a, a champion. And then all of a sudden, she's struck down, and she's this horrible bigot. And she's e- even though they're, they're in a worse position with it because they can't cancel her either, because she owns the rights to the, to Harry Potter, and so she controls the direction of it, and she gets to decide whether something Harry Potter is made or not. And obviously, Harry Potter is like the biggest franchise ever, so everyone wants to make money off Harry Potter, and so the Twitter activists are stuck in this position where they can't cancel her, and so they have to just continually disavow her. So every time Harry Potter's come out, it's like, well, I love Harry Potter, but J.K. Rowling's a bigot. So, oh my god. I've I've even seen this in like just daily oh. life, like scrolling through my own yeah. like per- personal social media. I, I see like news stories mm. of like some new Harry Potter thing coming yeah. out. I don't follow it because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm far too old. But um, I see comments just like, I really want to read this, but unfortunately, <laughs> J.K. Rowling is a bigot, so yeah. I'm not going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's it's mad, isn't it? And it's you can you can even see them like lamenting that they they can't read what she's wrote so it's not yeah. like they think as an author she's got nothing to bring to the table it's just that they don't want to touch her kind of output because of yep. her wrong think essentially yep and again like the whole the whole thing just drips with sort of cultiness where it's just like oh god come on i think what's particularly compelling for that argument is that the fact that these these messages are going to be going out in such huge numbers that mm. realistically no one she's not actually going to see what they're saying so it's more for the the people That's that right. are associated with the person sending the message seeing it it's virtue signaling it, essentially it, which is about compliance with the group it's about Absolutely, showing yeah. the demarcation the in versus the out you know and and notice how it's always like I, I argue with these people all the time, and uh, thankfully a lot of the time they don't realise who I am, you know, because they use my, <laughs> you know, my real name on Facebook. So they don't, they don't like have an automatic response. And so I'll, I'll approach it and just any, any sort of uh, bit of leverage where I could try and, but look, this is a reasonable point, but it would slightly push apart the narrative. Instantly shut down. Instantly shut down. They're like, no, I'm not even going to engage with this. You're a bigot. That's it. And it's like. You don't even know anything about me, but you've assumed all of this stuff because dissent is haram. You can't do this. And so I become an outsider based on the dissent and my lack of compliance with the narrative that's been laid down by the group. And that happens all automatically. It's like self-patrolling. That's that's got to be probably the most important principle as well, because Mm -hmm. as as soon as that rule breaks down, then they're going to come into contact with conflicting ideas, which affects their conviction. And therefore, it could lead to... I suppose an upward spiral of them getting out of the cult. Well, it, well, that's the thing because, like, the reaction that I get whenever I interrogate them, um, I'm, I'm always, I'm always careful not to be offensive, right? Not to be, uh, not to swear, not to call them names or anything like that. But 
if I just approach them with the criticisms I have of their definition of woman, which the definition of woman that they use is always a woman is anyone who defines themselves as a woman or identifies as a woman. It's like, right, that, that's not a sentence. That's not a definition. A definition can't be self-referential. Otherwise, it actually fails to be a complete sentence because you're saying a woman is anyone who identifies as a woman is anyone who identifies as. And so you get this infinitely recurring pattern. And none of them seem to be in any way capable of addressing these kind of criticisms. That's like, well, I just don't have to think about it. You're a bigot blocked. So. Yeah, well, it the part of the kind of whole narrative is that mm -hmm. you don't question... Yeah. The idea is, you, if, as Avoiding soon as you question dissent, it yeah. or try and rationalise or explain yeah. it, the in inconsistencies will show and yeah. then you're going to cease to believe it. Yeah. Therefore, they're, they're always very, very emotional as well. It's, you know, you can tell it's very much sort of like um, the. it's a very aggressive stance that they take to what I consider, you know, I thought was a fairly, you know, just plain spoken criticism, you know, like it if you're talking about the definition of words, it couldn't get more dry and academic almost, could it? Like well, exactly, right? It's really boring. And so it, like, it sounds like it should be really boring. But the highly emotional responses I've been getting just from these just regular groups, and, and it's just like, wow, the, this indoctrination really has roots, man. Well, it, I think it maps onto people's insecurities, ultimately, mm. in that um, people will have these feelings of probably a lack of belonging, a lack of identity, and belonging to a group hmm. seems to provide this to people. And therefore, in having this provided for them, they feel like they owe something to the group. And therefore, it's it's almost like their moral duty to defend the group and its beliefs. Hmm. And that's why they will have such a emotionally charged kind of counter argument because they feel like it's an attack on them and their group and therefore you know their identity and how they orient themselves in the world yeah the, the, I, I i was thinking about this like you could describe it as like moral security um as in like you you feel like you're a good person because you feel like you have a good moral system and you feel like the decisions you make using this, you know, ethical system of yours, and the moral decisions you make using your ethical system are uh, consistent with what a good person does. And so, if you're if you've been advocating for uh, trans rights, whatever that's supposed to include, and you go quite far down the road, and maybe you've had a few friends who have become trans, struggling as they might be, you know, that you're like, no, I've done my part to try and help them. If someone were to come along and say, actually, everything you've done has actually been harmful and is actually immoral, uh, then I think what is essentially a kind of like a, a, a kind of overcommitment to a position, right? And so, like, if if someone if someone tomorrow came out and uh, said to me, uh, look, you, you've been paying your employees on time uh, and you thought that was good. And so you were sleeping soundly at night, but actually it turns out that's evil and that's actually hurting them. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying this is something they could do, but let's assume that was the case, right? I'd be like, oh my God, oh my God. And then I, but then suddenly you get this kind of great unraveling where all of the moral steps you'd taken up until that point, all of them become suspect. And then you could find yourself in this kind of like ethical collapse where your entire system has just been taken from under you, out from under you, uh, just with one you know linchpin being pulled out and I'm, I'm genuinely at the point where i think that's what is the problem in engaging in these kind of discussions with them i don't necessarily think that's even a cult thing necessarily no, it might no, be I more think... more prominent in yeah. in kind of cult behavior but yeah. i think when people are confronted with conflict it isn't necessarily that they they want to get to the the kind of nitty gritty of the yeah. ideas it's that there's someone who's disagreeing with them and it's more of a personal thing to them it's more about saving face mm. and not looking stupid um essentially i think I, I think that in this particular case with this subject it is deeper than that though um because it like it, it's there's a huge amount of superstructure that's built on top of the presupp the presupposition that uh, the definition of woman is not adult human female. And if that's changed, then the whole thing is wrong. And so, like, the moral commitments you have made over the years, this becomes, and this becomes, like, a core part of your 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 worldview. I think, I think it's very similar to the Christians looking at the Church of Satan and saying, well, hang on, if that's valid, 
then maybe what I'm doing is invalid. And this, you know, it's a direct attack on all of your moral structures. And so I think this is why they, they get really upset. And it likes it's not not, not a cult thing necessarily, mm-hmm. but I think it's heightened in these sort of cult like conditions to where these people are really aggressive. Like they, they, uh, like I get all sorts of allegations thrown at me that are by by just inquiring about the definition. I think it might also come from the fact that I don't necessarily think um in in that specific case it's coming from a bad place either. No, no. Like it's not insincere. Um I mm. feel like they probably feel like they're they're being a good person, and yes. it might actually kind of anchor them in feeling emotionally secure, and you know that they can go about their their daily life feeling like they're good and yeah. worthwhile, and it gives them confidence. And if you're taking that away from them, yes, then you're you're robbing them of yeah almost their. I'm trying to think of the word. It's a way of kind of like grounding yourself in a moral reality, I think. Yeah. I, I, I don't have a good particular term for it, but that's what I think is happening, where they, they, they view themselves as kind of like set squarely. You know, we can, we, I, I'm firm here. You know, it is right that this is the case and this is the case. And if, if the underlying presupposition is attacked, then you're essentially turning their entire world on its head. Sure. So it's not surprising they'd be terrified of this, right? I think... I think it's more that it's it's the foundation on which other personality mm-hmm. factors are constructed. Mm-hmm. In I think a, a very base level, people want to feel like they're they're good. Mm. I think in thinking that you're a bad person, that mm. has very detrimental psychological effects on you, mm. even if you're almost happy with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even if it wasn't something that morally you object to. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think I think that that's that's definitely something that is worth thinking about more. Um, but yeah, so anyway, basically, um, coming back to the pink news thing, um, I, I agree that it probably is a trans cult, but, um, to be honest with you, I think it probably is a bit of a cult on the Christian side too. Not because it's religion, it's because the online environments they exist in. Uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely not one sided. (laughs) Like you you only need to look at like the Westboro Baptist church and (laughs) there's a, a perfect example there of, it's it's got the isolated community. What yep. Was it Fred Phelps was the leader? Yep. Dependence on the leader, devaluing the outsider, avoiding dissent. So they all they all agree mm-hmm. on a particular narrative. Everyone who doesn't agree with this is a bad person. Uh, everyone complies with the behaviour of the group, going out and protesting, placarding, and of course the dependence on the supreme leader, who can never be wrong about anything. And uh, yeah, so that describes I think the Westboro Baptist Church. But I think that the the, the the way that the sort of like you know the cultural revolution of the left at the moment is very interesting. How it's it's like Mao's cultural revolution without Mao, you know. <laughs> it's it's like it's come up you know from academia without needing a dear leader. I think that's very interesting. But uh, I guess the topic it's for like another time. Decentralized yeah. cult behavior almost in yeah. that. Uh, I, I do believe though that the term leader. I know we conventionally think of it as mm. one person but it can be spread amongst many people who are like thought leaders i've heard could the term an banded around couldn't it yeah you know because if we're talking about like the institution of social media um it, you know essentially it provides the same function because what the dear leader does is give you the orthodoxy that you are going to follow and if you get that from twitter then it's exactly the same it's just you know it's not one person it's a hive mind that's issuing all of these you know moral legislations and instructions to you but at the end of the day, if it's fulfilling the same function, what difference does it make? Absolutely, yeah. 